Dear God, just thank you for this time to come and worship you this morning together, remotely again, and um, just for the opportunity to still um, sing together and um, just being able to do this during this uh, crazy time that we're living through. Um, I was reading Romans and just talking about how we're not justified by works, but by faith. And it was just really powerful to know that we don't have to earn that salvation or earn things by the law, but um, by one who was perfect, died on the cross and saved us um, just by faith alone, just as Abraham and everybody in the Old Testament, they were credited to them because of their faith, not because of what they did or accomplished. And uh, let us know that just take courage in that and that we can uh, worship you and believe in you and know that we'll be saved and protected and, and accounted to us as righteousness, Lord. I'll just sing this uh, morning. find my place till heaven reached down your love it called my name out of my shame out of the dead of night into a hope into a marvelous light oh it's your mercy i don't deserve your mercy but you would reach down for me and keep me as your own for your glory i'm living for your glory and i will tell the story of your unfailing love be glorified be lifted high in all my life be glorified though i may run though i may fall apart chasing this world things that will break your heart but faithful and true, sure as the rising sun. One thing is true, one thing is sure to come. Oh, it's your mercy, I don't deserve your mercy. That you would reach down for me and keep me as your own. For your glory, I'm living for your glory, and I will tell the story of your unfailing love. Be glorified, be lifted high in all my life. Be glorified, be glorified.
your mercy I don't deserve your mercy that you would reach down for me and keep me as your own and for your glory I'm living for your glory and I will tell a story of your unfailing love your unfailing love well I'm certainly glad that uh, everybody's uh, here remotely here to worship the Lord today and I just pray that uh, uh, it'll be a fruitful and wonderful wonderful time of worship and uh, just uh, thank you for being with us then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art oh Lord my God when I am awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder thy power throughout the universe display then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees when I look down from lofty mountains grandeur and see the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow with humble adoration and then proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. 
How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Well, hopefully we're coming to the uh, light at the end of the tunnel or the, the end of this long journey we've kind of been on of dryness probably for a lot of people and, and for uh, um, the nation, even not, not only just our church. But um, I'm in the Psalms again, as always, it seems like, every time. But I was just going to read a, a, a verse. And I was just thinking about the first song, Your Mercy. I've been thinking about what Anthony said. Saved by grace alone, Christ alone, um, faith alone, and to God's glory alone. And uh, I'm just going to read out of Psalm 40 here, verse 11. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. Um, God's uh, love, his steadfast love, as we were talking before we... Um, had a worship service here was uh, it's never wavering my love is my love is fickle but God's is not and it's just uh, it's awesome it really is and uh, will you worship with us with the next song Ashamed of what I've done, what I've become, these hands are dirty. I dare not lift them up to the Holy One. You plead my cause, you right my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you give your life to give me mine, you say that I am free, how can it be? Yeah. How can it be? I've been hiding Afraid I let you down Inside I doubt That you could love me but in your eyes there's only grace now. You plead my cause, you right my wrongs, you break my chains, you overcome, you give your life. To give me mine, you say that I am free. How can it be? Yeah. How can it be? You write my wrongs, you 
break my chains you overcome you give your life to give me mine you say that i am free Well, good morning, Crossroad. It is good that we can uh, join together again uh, over God's Word together. And so if you have uh, your Bibles this morning, go ahead and take those and turn to the book of Romans. And we'll be in chapters, uh, well, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 8. Uh, Romans 3, uh, 1 through 8, with a uh, title this, uh, of the sermon being, The Jewish Advantage. The Jewish Advantage. Uh, this morning, I want you to kind of know a little bit what we're getting ready to do. What we're getting ready to do is jump right in to this text. Uh, no funny story, nothing to get your attention and draw you in. Uh, honestly, there is so much going on this morning in this text that literally I feel like we just need to jump in with, 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 with both feet right now at this moment. Uh, and so all I can do to you this morning is to, from the very get-go is to say this, uh, to try to draw you in is this. Uh, it's merely an invitation. It's an invitation for you to think, to experience, to, to contemplate uh, possibly a text of Scripture in the book of Romans that I believe oftentimes, maybe not with you, but oftentimes gets overlooked or maybe uh, not understood very well. And, and I just want you to know this this morning before we start. It's driven me crazy this month, uh, this, this week, as I was studying this text. As I took the Bible and began to see this passage, I'm overwhelmed with a sense of uh, a humility uh, concerning, well, the gospel, God's grace and His mercy. And what I mean by that is, in, through this text this morning, we're going to see God's grace and mercy given to the Jew. And we're going to see how that grace and mercy is also dispensed and given to the Gentile. The Christian. And, and it is my prayer that God would use the feebleness of my mouth and my intellect uh, to somehow stir in you the same fire that is burning inside of my stomach, so to speak. I, 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 reading this makes me want to just go run over the top of a mountain and say, do something for God's glory because, because of what is here. And I hope that this morning's text could do that somehow for you as well. And I know the only way that I can possibly hope that that could happen is if we go to God's Word and if we pray such things. And so this morning, we're going to jump right in. And I want to go ahead and do that by reading God's Word together this morning. So let us read this text, Romans 3, 1 through 8 together. And it says there, Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. That if, that if, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though every one were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to His glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil 
that God may that good may come as some slanderously charge us with saying and Paul says their condemnation is just let us pray before we start Lord God, we come before you this morning. And Lord, I pray that you would be in your word, this word before us. Lord, that you would use the, 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 the feebleness of my mouth and my mind to somehow uh, to help uh, declare the truth of your word. Lord, your word, not my word, your word is where power lies. Lord, that is where change uh, originates. And Lord, we pray that your word would take full root into our souls and minds this morning. That we would not depart from it and it would not depart from us. And Lord, in order for that to occur, we depend greatly upon the Holy Spirit. We depend on you, Lord God, to open our minds and our eyes, to understand, to comprehend, and to perceive. Help us to do all these things this morning for your glory, for our good, and the good of those who still do not yet know you. Oh God, we do pray. Amen and amen. Well, as you saw last week, the Apostle Paul has been knocking out the cards and the poker hand, so to speak, of the Jews for some time. He's been calling their bluff left and right as to the cards in which they sought to play in regards to their salvation. And we saw that last week playing out. This week, we see Paul uh, seem to be acknowledging or seeking to answer some criticisms and or questions or pushbacks that the Jews may have had for him as he taught and as he began to advocate these teachings and these things that he's writing in the book, in, in the book of Ro uh, Romans. It's almost as if he's dealt with these criticisms before. And so uh, this morning, what I want us to do, by jumping straight into this text, is to see how the text itself gives us what I would say possibly three questions being lobbed or pushed at Paul in regards to his teaching, and three advantages that Paul gives in relation to their questions. So three questions and three advantages. And so in order to do that well, we need to ask the first question. And the first question this morning that I believe is found in our text is, what advantage has the Jew? If, if everything that you just said, Paul, about circumcision not meaning anything, us being born and having the law means nothing, it becomes a moot point unless we've been circumcised of heart, um, then what advantage is there of being Jew? Well, what good is circumcision? Uh, they wanted to know, Paul, are you trying to say that we Jews are no longer special? And you know good and well that they wanted to be special. And we see this in verse 1 and 2. And look what it says there. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? And Paul says in verse 2, much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Entrusted with the oracles of God. Entrusted, meaning to be, uh, to be uh, um, given responsibility, to be tasked with, to be queefed something. You've been entrusted with something. It's, it's, a, it's a privilege. It's a responsibility. And what is that responsibility? It's the oracles of God. In other words, you could say Scripture. For from the Jew comes the first five books of the law, which is known as the Torah. We have, uh, through the Jews, we have the wisdom literatures. We have the history. Through the Jews, we have the prophets. In other words, he is saying to them, you as Jews have come the law, the prophets, God's instruction. In other words, you, nation of Israel, you the Jews, are the people in whom God has spoken to and through in order to reach all the nations. No other nation on the face of the planet had God been dealing with in such a fashion and form than the Jews. And he says, before entrusted with the oracles of God, he says, to begin with. Now, why is that important? Because I want you to know that when he uses the word to begin with, he's starting a list of advantages for being a Jew. And he starts it here in, in chapter 3, but he doesn't pick up the list until um, chapter 9. 
And so he starts this morning in our text with advantage number one that we see here. What is the advantage? The advantage of being a Jew is to have the oracles of God, to be entrusted with the, that such oracle. But I want you to see the full nature of that list before we go for, forward. And the full nature of that list can be found, picked back up in Romans 9, 4 through 5. And it says there, In whom are Israelites, to whom belong the adoption as sons, and the glory, and the covenant, and the giving of the law, and the temple service, and the promises. Whose are the fathers, in other words, the leaders and those who came before us, and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Paul in no way is downplaying the importance of the specialness of the Jews. We learn here that he is saying that you are the people <clears throat> of the Word. You are people in whom God has spoken. You see, the Gentiles cannot claim such things. Uh, everyone who was born and, 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 and um, brought up from any other nation prior, before Jesus, and before the coming of the Holy Spirit specifically, could not boast of such a claim. And, and, and yet, the Jews asked the question, what advantage is there by being a Jew? Paul's answer here is, much in every way. Number one, though, because you are people of the Word. You have it before you. And that will make more sense in just a little bit later as we go forward. But let's go forward. Because before us now is question number two. Question number two is this. Okay, Paul, we hear what you're teaching. We know what you've said and what you've been saying about all these things about our religion, about the law, about circumcision. But my question to you back, Paul, is this, what about God's promises? I mean, it sounds like you're saying that what God promised He would do through all these things, and these are promises, these point to the promise, um, that somehow or another that God is turning His back or He's, he's, he's relenting on a promise that He's made. Or, 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 Paul, are you making God out to be a liar? In other words, Paul, don't you know? Haven't you read the Scripture? Don't, haven't you read my T-shirt? We are Yahweh's kids. And we see this in verses 3 through 4. And it says there, What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judge. Uh, Paul, are you making light of God's promises? Paul says, by no means am I doing this. Meaning, this is nowhere close to what we are teaching and we believe. There is no sin or lie in God. And Paul, as if saying, uh, what I am saying, what he is teaching, what he is advocating in the gospel, does not pull God one inch away from his faithfulness to Israel. But here was the problem for Israel. The problem for Israel, for these Jews thought that they were immune somehow, wholesale, by being Jews by birth, by doing some things in religion from God's wrath and from God's judgment. Meaning they had misunderstood and they had misapplied and misrepresented God's promises. These promises that they speak of did not serve as universal claims, meaning every Jew who had ever been born in, in every point in time in history. There was not, there is not, and there was not some sort of two way uh, conversion or two way salvation. One salvation for the Jew and one salvation for the, Jew, the believing Gentile or, or Christian. As if there's two. And usually, typically, the Jew saw it as being an automatic thing. If we're Jews, we're automatically in. The rest of them can fight it out if they have to, but we Jews. We're automatically uh, immune somehow to God's uh, wrath or judgment because we are people of the promise. 
Now, sadly, even within Christianity, there are many within Christianity who actually teach this. That there are somehow two salvations, one for the Jew and one for the Gentile. And they'll even go so far as to even teach that the Jews, by promise, because of their birth, are automatic ends. And brothers and sisters, that is not the case and to make that point even clearer, Paul, here right here in verse 4, says that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. What he's doing is he's quoting David from Psalm 51. Now what's important about that is this. Psalm 51 is when David stands before God and repents. He basically begs God for forgiveness. This is right after he had just taken uh, Bathsheba to be his, uh, well, not, well, his wife, but he got her impregnated, another man's wife. He took that man, Uriah the Hittite, who, who, by the way, was an upright and honorable man, and he put him on the front lines to be murdered, to kill him. And then he hid it, and he lied about it as to cover it up. And when his sin was exposed, and as it was seen for what it was, this Psalm 51, verse 4, which Paul here is quoting here in our text this morning, says this. Against you, you alone, or excuse me, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. In other words, David says here that the reason God would be just to judge him is that his sin was against God. David's sin makes God's judgment of David righteousness. It's righteous. It is true to God's nature. It is true to his glory. And, and so this righteousness is, is faithfulness to God's covenant. In other words, what I'm saying is, when, 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 when David writes Psalm 51, notice he says nothing of being a Jew. This is the king of the Jews at one point. This was a man who was known as a friend of God. In Psalm 51, there is no, well, I'm really sorry, but I, you know I am a Jew and I am a person of the promise. No, no, no. He begs God for his mercy and his grace. If, if God were to judge the Jew due to faithlessness, this would not somehow, this is what it means, it would not somehow nullify God as being faithful. Let me explain. In the Old Testament, there are times God gave promises, sure enough, and true. But there are also times in those promises that God says to the nation of Israel, if you do this, then I will do this. If you do this, then I will respond and do this, both negatively and positively. And what I need you to understand is this. The nation of Israel had continually broken covenant from God time and time and time and time again. In other words, their faithlessness never, never was to point somehow to God somewhere along the way being less faithful. God had always been faithful and their faithlessness did not nullify God being faithful. And yet, I need you to understand something even outright. The nation of Israel had continually cheated on God. The, the prophets say that she acted like a whore, whoring around with other lovers. And yet, we still see that the promise stands God's grace is still given to the Jews through promise. God has not turned His back on the nation at all. The Jews may have misunderstood the nature of God's faithfulness. They absolutely misunderstood the nature of His righteousness. But they were correct to believe that whatever He had promised, He will do. And Paul seems to even agree, as he says here in our text, let God be true and every man a liar. Now to make that point, I want you to see what God, what, what, what God says through the prophet Jeremiah to the nation of Israel, speci specifically speaking of this, these promises. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16 says this, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. 
In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And, and this is the name by which it will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. And in my notes, I put the word boom. Boom. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Jewish promise. They were misrepresenting the promise. The promise is Jesus. Not this other. The promise is Jesus. They, look, they need look no further. This had always been the plan of God. All that Israel had thought to claim as their promises from God had better not been to miss this point. This was the entire point. And sadly, many of the Jews, specifically in Paul's day, as he's writing to the, to, the, to the church in Rome, were Jews who were missing the point of the promise. You see, all of Scripture, that they, advantage one, had been given, all of Scripture had been to point them to the reality of their need of Jesus Christ as Jews. The covering in the garden for Adam and Eve pointed to Jesus Cain's sacrifice in Genesis pointed to Jesus. Abraham's sacrifice. And, and consequently, as he looked and he saw the promise of the Messiah, that who would one day come, he longed to see the day. And it was credited to him as righteousness was a picture of Jesus. Passover is a picture of Jesus. The temple and the celebrations such as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, pointed the nation of Israel to Jesus. All this tradition, all this privilege, all these advantages was to point them to their Jewish promise, Jesus Christ. And you need know, God is not wrong to judge, nor is He somehow now unfaithful in His promises because of what He is doing for the Gentile and what He's saying to the Jew. Because I need to ask the question, did God's promise fail? Not at all. Jesus is still before the nation of Israel today as their Jewish Messiah. The question is this. Jews, do you boast in all your religion and all your tradition? Or do you boast in Him whom, whom all your religion and all your tradition is to point to? Jesus Christ, your Messiah. It leads me to question three. Okay, Paul, we understand. We have the advantage of the, of the Word of God. We are His people in that regard. We have the advantage of the Jewish Messiah. He will flow from us and, 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 and unto us. But what about holiness, Paul? Uh, are you saying it does not matter how one acts? You're saying that if we put faith in Jesus alone, that that's enough. But, but, but Paul, we, we look at those Gentiles and we see them. They don't act like us. They're pretty crude. They're rough around the edges. They don't, they don't have the law. They don't celebrate our celebrations. They don't have our holidays, Paul. Don't you care about the way one acts? Are you teaching something different? We see this in verses 5 through 8. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. David showed us that, right? Continues. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to His glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why... Not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying. Now look at that last part. As some people slanderously charge us with saying. You see, in order to discredit Paul, these Jews began to say that Paul was teaching such things. That, that this is what they were telling people concerning Paul's teachings. This gospel that Paul s speaks of, it, he's not concerned with holiness. He says, believe in Jesus and that's all you got to do. 
And this is a teaching that is known today as antinomianism. We call it hyper-grace, or, or I call lazy grace. That Paul was somehow a Jewish liberal progressive walking around in Jewish clothing telling people, hey look, you don't need to take your religion all that seriously anymore. Just believe in Jesus and sin as much as you want. Because grace may abound. Because Jesus will cover it. Because it's enough. Listen, you need to know this could not have been further from the truth of the gospel that Paul preached. This was a mischaracterization of what Paul taught, plain and simple. However, this too is a lie from the Jews to discredit Paul and to discredit his gospel. And we know that Paul feels like this is an opposition to his teaching and gospel, and he needs to give it an answer. We know that because he does so in Romans 6, 1-5. This question that we see presented looks like in our text this morning. He answers there, and he says this there. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism, baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Which means Jesus Christ will, yes, find you where you are. And He takes you just as you are. But Jesus Christ will not and does not leave you there. The Holy Spirit will not allow you to sit in that place forever. And this is where the teachings of the Apostle Paul differentiates themselves from, say, Roman Catholicism and what the Jews believed. You see, for what the Jews believed... What, as the Roman Catholics tend to believe these days, is that the true uh, mathematics of salvation goes something like this. That faith plus good works equals justification before God. Now they were saying that Paul no longer teaches that. He teaches antinomianism. He teaches some other equation. And Paul's equation is this. Faith... Faith alone equals justification before God without works, without holiness, without righteousness. And brothers and sisters, we know that's not true. For the proper and true equation, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Paul, the gospel of grace, the gospel which the whole Old Testament points, is faith alone equals justification plus good works. We don't do good works to become justified. Our good works flow out of us because we are justified, because we are made new. And this is what I want you to know real quick, church. Paul never taught, nor did he believe such nonsense as this. Nor do I personally advocate such as your pastor. God never justifies a person without first regenerating him or her by the power of the Holy Spirit. That is that the person receiving salvation is always given a new nature, a new heart, a new mind, a new appetite for the things that bring God glory and honor. And we, oftentimes in the Reformed theology tradition, must be careful in this. We are big grace people, and rightly so, we ought to be. But there will be and there must be change. To think and advocate anything different is simply to teach a shallow gospel. A gospel that has the power to save but not the power to change. Our gospel goes even further. The good news goes further than salvation alone. Can you believe I'm saying that? Yes, it goes past salvation even and to the point that you and I will not and will no longer be the same. We will be different. That's how powerful the gospel and the power of the gospel is. Paul so hated what these Jews were trying to do to him and the gospel which he preached. In this assertion, that what does he say? In our text it says, they, those who do that, their condemnation, regardless of whether they're Jews, their condemnation is just. Why? Because they corrupt the gospel. They lead people away from the Jewish promise, Jesus. 
This is advantage number three to the Jew. Through Christ, they will have the Jewish Messiah and promise sure, but they will also be the people, the nation from which the gospel, the good news, were to flow and to come. You could say that they are the people of witness. Which leads me to my conclusion of this morning's text. Church, I need you to know something this morning. Salvation is through the Jew. And it has come from the Jews. As we will learn later in the book of Romans, Gentiles, you and I, Christians, we must and are indebted to the Jews. They are the root, meaning from them flow and through them flow God's Word. Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And through them we have their witness. Remember, I and you possibly today are Christians, along with being called by God, of course, and being sealed with the Holy Spirit. We are Christians due to Jews. We are Christians due to Moses. We are Christians due to David. We are Christians due to the witness of Paul, to Peter, to John, to Jesus Christ. And this was to be the very reality for all those Jews who had come to know Jesus as their Messiah, the culmination and the finalization of the promise. Jews like Peter, James, and John, listen to me, Christian. They never converted to Christianity. In placing their hope, their trust in Jesus Christ, they merely became completed Jews. Jews of the promise. This is so important as we will soon see in chapter 9. But for now, I want you to know that Paul says this morning to the Jews, enough already. Stop from looking at all those Gentiles over there as to say that somehow they've been given something that's nullified God's promise to you. Just because God's grace and mercy has been given to them does not change one iota, one inch from the promise that God has made with the nation of Israel. It's a special one. They are the people of promise. They are the people with much advantage. He's saying to them, stop looking over there at them and look at what you have. Look what you have been given. Look at your promised Messiah. Do that and you will have what those Gentiles have found that somehow in your religion and in your pride have not been able to found or you, you have overlooked. Those who are blind and had not the advantages and privileges that you have been given as the people of Israel, they see their blind eyes have come to understand, know, and to trust. Look to them, O oh Jews. Look to the Gentiles and learn from them. See what they see. Look what they run after. God's promises have never ceased from you. They are still intact to the Jew. God is not a liar. Reach out and receive Him. This morning there has been so much spoken. So much. I, I usually don't, you don't even know how much I've cut out. So much I wish to say. So many analogies I wish to use. But I want you to know this morning through our text that the Apostle Paul is asked three questions. And he gives them the first question of what advantage has there in being a Jew. And Paul says much in every way. Through the Jew comes the Word of God and all the traditions that point to Him. Through the Jew comes the Messiah. And through the Jew comes the witness of that Messiah in whom we are beneficiaries of. Thank God for the Jews. Keep praying for the Jews. And as we will see, these two aspects, God's grace and mercy to the Jew, God's grace and mercy to the Gentile, later on in chapter 9 will come to a full head. God bless you all this morning. Until we meet again, amen. Let's sing our last song together this morning.
sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betray. The sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus' way. Silent as he stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross of salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. of heaven's God's own Son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed Him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross of salvation where your love poured out over me Whoa. Now my soul cries out Hallelujah Praise and honor unto me Now my debt is paid It is paid by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled, now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, always free. salvation where your love poured out over me yeah. now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto me see the stone Praise and honor unto Thee. 